Hello everyone, I'm Captain Logan and it's not Spawn here. It is day 69 of my comic review video day calendar. We are still hip deep in the middle of Bat March and that means it's time for another random disparate Batman title from another era in Batman comics. And today I'm going to take a look at Brave and the Bold number 141. Not to be confused with the comic tie-ins with the cartoon show. I actually reviewed one of those just the other day. This is unrelated. This is from 1960. 78, and this is a comic featuring a Batman with Black Canary. During this period of Breathing the Bold, it's always Batman and some other superhero. This is written by Bob Haney, who starts his comic career all the way back in the mid-40s, and this very much has golden to Silver Age sensibilities. Uh, I would say certainly Silver Age, at the very least, uh, in its writing, it feels a little outdated, a little out of touch uh, at this point in 1978 when you're looking at uh, Green Arrow and uh, some of the other uh, kind of more socially conscious uh, comics. And this was a guy who was really well known for writing topical stories in the 60s, but by the time he got to this period, uh, I think he was having a difficult time uh, finding story ideas that really resonated with people the way they did back in his heyday, which is a bit of a shame. I enjoy this a lot. It is pretty corny, particularly with a lot of the one-liners, but he's really inventive in the kind of Silver Age detective Batman story that we have here, and refreshing for me just to read another kind of standard uh, Batman's gotta figure out who is behind this terrible plot sort of story that's not pretentious, isn't trying to be super deep about Batman's psychology, isn't deconstructing Batman, uh, isn't really talking about the yin-yang uh, relationship with Batman and the Joker, I, you need me, I need you, uh, we're two sides of the coin, none of that stuff, it's just the Joker is a lone shark, everybody thought he was dead, and he's been working in secret to try to continue surviving, and he just can't help himself but to mess with people and kill people because that's fun for him. No deeper psychology than that, and uh, Batman starts uncovering uh, this uh, this crazy conspiracy to kill uh, random businessmen all across the uh, city of Gotham, which turn out to be... Uh, the, the one thing they have in common is that they've all gotten into bed with this loan shark who is charging them inordinate amounts of interest intentionally to make it impossible for them to pay him back so that he can have fun blowing them up with tiny micro bombs that he has secretly, we'll find out by the end, inserted into them somehow from uh, glasses of wine. Uh, th this comic is kind of crazy. Uh, it it's, it's a really insane plot, and I really enjoyed reading it. Art here is by the great Jim Aparo, one of my absolute favorite Batman artists, and a treat to see his art going back this far, drawing Batman and Joker in the more classic Neil Adams style. Uh, for a second, I thought maybe this was Adams' art, just looking at this initial splash page, but it is Jim Aparo, and it becomes real clear just looking at this first page proper, uh, that that's who we're dealing with, even if you don't, if, if you're familiar with him, even if you don't look at the credits, that is Jim Aparo's Batman head, that's how he deals with shadows, uh, his Batman kind of uh, bent over on, on top of a roof thinking uh, that seems to be Aparo's kind of favorite Batman pose. He's got a particular kind of thing he does with the cowl and the eyebrows that is uh, very much a hallmark of his work. Uh, something else to mention about the writer Bob Haney. Uh, so he was the co-creator of the Teen Titans, and he also created Metamorpho and the original Super Sons. And I always forget that Super Sons was already like a golden age thing 
maybe it's Silver Age. I think I think it goes back farther than that. Uh, well before we have the modern now, uh, uh, John Kent and uh, Damian Wayne that we've put together, and we're now calling the Super Sons. But that's that's where that whole thing goes back to. Uh, sometimes we'll do. Stories like that that harken back to old imaginary stories or golden age stories that uh, a lot of modern readers probably don't realize is throwback or is reinventing an old idea, kind of like Superman Red and Superman Blue as well. Uh, but let me go ahead and just take you through the story. It's It's a wild ride. First of all, there are a couple of phrases we just cannot get away from with this comic. In On the cover, uh, the Joker because it's very popular during this period, especially to have, uh, well, I say this period, in the 60s and 70s especially, uh, to have the words on the cover, to have uh, characters speaking dialogue, give you a sense of what the story is going to be about beyond just the visuals. Uh, Masked Manhunter, Joker calls Batman here, and it's almost as if, that's a moniker that you you would expect to be more popular than Cape Crusader. It comes up so many times in this comic. He calls him that again in the opening splash page. And this scene does happen later in the comic, but we don't see exactly this. Uh, I was going to say dialogue exchange, I guess just diatribe from the Joker. Uh, this is a thing that I always think is a little bit odd, but I like better than the way we do it now, I guess. We're, we kind of drop you in Matus Rest. I guess I'll go back to the point I was making for a second and just say Mass Manhunter comes up like four, five, six times in, in the issue. And I don't remember that being used all that often in Batman comics, but here it's like that's the main thing that, that we call Batman. But anyway, uh, these days we, we tend to do the Inmatus Rest thing where you'll have a scene that takes place in the most exciting, uh, maybe even climactic part of the comic in of the story, and then we dial everything back and we say we have a we have a narration box and we'll say a few days earlier or however long it was, and then you've got to play catch up and it can be kind of tedious to do that. This is sort of that same thing except it's more like an ad. It's it, it's almost like a second cover more than anything and this was real popular during the Stanley era of Marvel certainly but if every serves what we'd see just as often or more often would be a splash page that actually is linear but is just still feels kind of in Matus Rest uh, where you're starting with a real exciting action thing and then you do move forward from that uh, but I guess this would happen as well even then, uh, so getting into this, I, I I got I got to mention right away that Batman is kind of throwing a lot of his friends and allies under the bus through this comic. I uh, or or maybe I should say Bob Haney is I uh, because. Gordon is not a very good detective, and he seems like kind of an idiot here. We're on the very first page, and it's uh, it's kind of an exciting moment. You see, uh, I, I guess I forgot to pull the art for this particular uh, uh, page, so my apologies. But on the so I'm not showing it here. But on the very first page, uh, after the that opening splash, you have two business owners that are blown up just right away. So it, it does jump you right into the story, and it doesn't feel like we're wasting time, and I, I wish I could just get to the Joker burying uh, Black Canary in a bunch of money. I uh, Because at first I was like, oh, I, I'm a little bit disappointed. I, I, I wish we were starting from that place. But then right away, oh, people are being blown up. What is causing this? Uh, it would be... Uh, more interesting uh, and, I, uh, you know, a bigger surprise if I didn't have Joker on the cover and if I didn't know that he's got to be who's behind all of this because we do play catch-up in the sense that we know that, but we have to watch Batman figure all of that out. But anyway, so you have two business owners that blow up in exactly the same way, and Gordon says, it kind of like Gordon and Batman Forever, I wonder if it's suicides. And Batman, thinking to himself, I guess not wanting to make Gordon feel bad, says, uh, no, Gordon, and he, I'm interjecting here, but he might as well say, you idiot. I, they, they died in exactly the same way. It's very clearly a homicide. Now, two does not a pattern make, but 
it is suspicious that they both happened on the same night, of course. And boy, it's, again, refreshing just to talk about a straight-up detective story like this, as <laughs> silly and kind of convoluted as it gets. But anyway... So uh, Batman is uh, running around town uh, in, investigating this and interrogating uh, thugs on the street, and he ultimately figures out that there is a loan shark, and the loan shark is calling himself, he's got an alias, uh, he's, he's calling himself Long Grin, or Long, Long Green, and then... Uh, at one point, there's an, an older woman who has uh, dealt with uh, some of the business owners that are uh, in bed with Long Green and uh, calls him, mistakenly says, Long Grin. At this point, Batman has already teamed up with Black Canary, who, let me say real quick, is in town because she is, and I don't know how long she did this job, I've never heard of, about this with Dinah Lance, but I guess she's into dressmaking, and she has a, she's working with a fashion designer who is uh, this big high-profile guy who is unveiling her uh, gown that she's designed, and that's why she's in Gotham. And so Batman teams up with her in order to uh, try to solve this mystery, and I... Uh, Black Canary says, wait a minute, I, th this woman mispronounced it, Long Grin, I, maybe it's the Joker, and that's very 60s Batman, and there, there actually is quite a bit of that kind of plotting through here, which is what makes it feel more like a Silver Age Batman story, certainly. There's a little bit more grit, there's a little bit more at stake than your average 60s Batman episode, or maybe even some of the comics that were published during that period, but... It is plotted a little bit like an episode of that show, and uh, anyway, one of the the phrases that keeps coming up that that I I was kind of surprised by because it's unusual is I'm used to Black Canary's power being called the Canary Cry, but here it's referred to repeatedly as the Sonic Scream. So I just wanted to throw that throw that out there. I uh, it's like I said, there there's an amusing juxtaposition totally with this because I uh, it feels. Uh, kind of gritty, kind of street level, uh, with you know seeing people explode on the very first page. Not that it's drawn real graphically or anything, but uh, some of the, some of the subject matter, especially if you're a kid reading this, uh, would feel kind of bleak. And you'd uh, it's one of those things where you'd probably feel like you were reading a very adult story, and then if you read it again as an adult in your twenty or twenties or thirties, you'd probably look back on it and go. Oh wait a minute! This is not anything like as gruesome or sophisticated as I thought it was. I, uh, after all, Batman is flying around with a black canary in his whirly bat, so there's some inherent absurdity here. I uh, I don't know how anybody ever put the whirly bat in anything with a straight face, and. You know, we, we certainly don't do that anymore. So anyway, uh, the character that gets thrown most under the bus in this, uh, even even more so than Gordon, is Alfred, who is made both... Uh, I, at least on first read, I felt like he was made a little bit incompetent or maybe just overly uh, like shy and unsure of himself. And then it kind of turns out that it's more that Batman doesn't give him the benefit of the doubt and Batman doesn't even really seem to care all that much about his well-being. Uh, Batman uses him as bait through this. So he is trying to get to the Joker, and so he says, well, what we need is somebody to take out a loan so that we can get closer to the Joker. And he, and I'm confused on this point. He says, well, Bruce Wayne could do it, but Joker might expect that because in the status quo with Batman right now, in, in this period, uh, Batman and Bruce Wayne are friends, uh, which I always thought was kind of silly because as soon as people find out that he's Batman, nobody's going to be that surprised by it. Oh, of course, he's palling around with his billionaire pal who is, of course, paying for all of his stuff. Yes, of course, that, or at least that would be the assumption you'd make. Yes, of course, Bruce Wayne is Batman. I'm so surprised. And then Morrison brings that back way later with Batman Incorporated. It kind of goes full circle, and it's just as silly there as it always was here, I think. But anyway... So he goes, well, we can't use Bruce Wayne. Joker will we'll see that coming. So instead, we'll use his butler. 
And you might be thinking, well, Alfred's not famous, so maybe Joker doesn't know that it's Bruce Wayne but that, that he works for. But Alfred tells the Joker that that's who he works for and says that he doesn't like Bruce Wayne anymore because uh, he he doesn't pay him enough and he's, he's not helping him when he's in these financial straits. And so uh, Joker makes a kind of conspires with Alfred to try to steal a bunch of money from Bruce Wayne, which is what he's supposed to bring to the Joker to pay for his loan. And if he doesn't, he's going to blow up. And Joker, while he is making this plan with Alfred and is threatening him the entire time, if he doesn't pay up, uh, pours him a glass of wine, which, as I alluded to earlier, will turn out to be the thing that gives him the micro bomb. Uh, I'm, I'm a Imagining it as almost like nanite size that will blow him up whenever Joker decides that he wants him to die. Well, Batman, not very sympathetic to Alfred's plight, even though he puts him in this situation, uh, says, Okay, Alfred, I need to know uh, about every sound you heard, everything you saw when you were with Joker. And Alfred says, Well, I, I was I was really nervous. This is a very difficult situation. Uh, I don't play undercover. This isn't what I do. This does not seem to be an Alfred that worked for the uh, for for any sort of military or has like a spy background like he often does or if he if he does he's very out of touch with all of that he's just a butler he he can clean he can sew that's about what he's good for this is not an Alfred that is if he is Batman's confidant I uh, he's not helping fix the car he's not designing the costumes he's not giving Batman in, in vice, it's in his missions. It's almost like there's this massive separation where he helps out with the Bruce Wayne side and really is not interested in that darker, uh, uh, twilight vigilante world. And so, I uh, Alfred says, "Look, I just Batman says there, there there must have been an important sound that would tell you that would give me a clue as to how Joker is is doing the bombs. Uh, there's this assumption that there's some some sort of sound, and Alfred says, I don't know what it is. I'm sorry. And Batman just keeps badgering him about it. And finally, Black Canary goes, and I, I guess she's supposed to be more sympathetic because she's the the woman in the issue. That's that's kind of how it reads. Uh, we're She's got the more motherly instinct. She's she's more uh, she's more empathetic because she's female. I uh, there's there's not a lot of I uh, you know complex characterization happening here, and those are something of the sensibilities of the time. Uh, we're getting a little bit more progressive by this point, but th that is that is certainly how it reads. And she goes, "Look, Batman, leave him alone. Like the Joker is after him. We need to worry more about his well being and his health." And speaking of that, uh, the very next thing that happens is as uh, Joker is meeting Alfred to get uh, Bruce Wayne's money from him. Uh, Black Canary shows up. They try to make it a trap. The trap backfires on them. Joker kidnaps Black Canary and puts her in a coffin filled with money. Uh, which is a really odd, kind of amusing image, and uh, then it finally Batman uh, is is able to deduce that it's the wine, uh, and that whatever sound he thought Alfred was, I don't remember where that comes from. Whatever sound he thinks that Alfred's supposed to remember, it doesn't really uh, factor in. Doesn't really have to have to do with anything. And then. Uh, by the end, this is the craziest thing that happens. Uh, the, the way we solve Alfred having a micro bomb in himself that could go off any moment. So th there is a period where they think Alfred is completely safe because they don't they, they, they didn't see Joker put a bomb in him anywhere and they don't see how it's possible that he could have done that. So it's like, oh Alfred, you're fine. And then they realize, oh, no, he has he's had a bomb in him this whole time. So this is where I'm saying Batman's really throwing Alfred under the bus. He's kind of an a-hole in this comic, to be to be blunt about it, because Joker could have killed him at any time through this, and he just got lucky that he never pulled the trigger. Batman is really using his butler just as bait here. And then at the end, uh, Batman has to perform a, this is so absurd, a blood transfusion in order to 
I eliminate the bomb, which I, I guess you can get rid of just by a chemical antidote. I don't really understand how that works, but Batman deduces that, and of course this is the only possible answer, right? Batman deduces that the Joker must have taken an antidote before he and Alfred both drank the wine, because Joker also drank the wine from the same bottle. So Batman, and this is such a leap, Batman says, okay, all we have to do is make a blood transfusion, and we'll give Alfred some of Joker's blood, and then he'll be immune to the blood bomb and then he'll be fine and not only is it nuts that it works but it's nuts that batman has the know-how to do said blood transfusion and there's no conversation whatsoever about blood type and whether or not they're even compatible uh this comic is hokey and nuts and bizarre and i really really enjoyed it uh it's it's a lot of fun. Anyway, thanks a lot for watching, folks. That's all I've got to say about that. And I'll be back again tomorrow with another Batman comic from probably a totally different era. Uh, I was Captain Logan, and I'll see you soon. Happy reading, folks. Bye, everybody.